is Grandmaster Ben Feingold. We have uh, one of our greatest lectures of all time. It hasn't even started yet. And we got to thank Grandmaster Gus. That's actually his legal name now. He doesn't know that, but we filed the paperwork. So the important thing is his name's not Gus, and he's not a Grandmaster. That's how you know. So Mr. Sargentini, if I pronounce that right, probably not. We have to thank him for this lecture. And not only did he pay for it, he had the idea for the lecture. Sometimes guys just donate money and say, yeah, lecture about something. I don't know. Uh, many people believe this is the greatest game ever played. Um, since Gus paid, sure it is. Okay. And obviously that's subjective. Now, I've analyzed this game myself many times, and I learned something new today. So we'll get to learn some stuff. Make sure you mute your microphone, otherwise I can hear you. Yeah, you didn't mute your microphone. All right. Um, so this is the game Kasparov Topolov from my favorite year, 1999, the year with the most nines in it in, in my lifetime. I think. Let's see. Let's carry the one. Yeah. And <clears throat> Kasparov, many people believe, is the greatest and or second greatest player who ever lived. And Topolov, obviously, was the world chess champion and a very sharp, dynamic player. Both players have styles where you're going to see lots of attacking and combinations. So that makes it a good game. And uh, about a year after this game was played, I was in Las Vegas at a chess tournament, and a friend of a friend came up to me and said, here's $100, explain this game to me. So I did, and then he said thanks. And then five minutes later, the blackjack dealer said thanks. Yeah, harsh. Okay, so Kasparov was white against Topolov, and one of the things that can happen when a game is brilliant is you have a, um, by the way, did you unplug the thing? A lot of plugs in there. All right. Um, one of the things that happens is if you have an opening that doesn't have a billion games and the players start thinking right away, then we get some exciting games. But if both players play 27 moves of preparation, that's less good. Okay. So this game was, uh, was a Pierce, which is... Uh, very unusual for the super top level. Now, there's lots of games in this position, but it's maybe like the 12th most common opening at the top level. It's just, don't see it very often. And White has many ways to play, and they played a very unusual way. He played Bishop E3, which is probably the fourth most common move. Um, F4 is the Austrian attack, named after Grandmaster Attack. Knight f3 is a reasonable move. Bishop e2, uh, bishop g5, lots of good moves. Bishop e3 is okay. Bishop g7, and queen d2. So no matter what level of chess you're at, you understand the queen and the bishop are lined up, and, you know, Kasparov probably wants to play bishop h6. Checkmate his opponent. Okay, c6. He wants to play b5 and get counterplay. And white played f3 to stop knight g4, which black could have played on the previous move but decided not to. And then b5, as was the point of c6. So if white plays in typical fashion of playing like a maniac and playing for checkmate, normally white would castle queenside since he's pushing all his kingside pawns. And, and, and black is ready for that. That's why black played b5. Man, having trouble with the arrows today. Terrible. Okay, so white developed his knight, knight g2, knight bd7, and finally he played bishop h6. And as you may have noticed, or maybe you didn't, Topolov could have castled kingside instead of playing c6, instead of playing b5, and instead of playing knight bd7, but he did not. So maybe Toplev has another idea in mind. 
trades. Bishop b7, completing development. Kasparov played a3, stopping black from playing b4. He finally fights in the center. Castles, queen e7, always play king b1. a6, knight c1, and long castle. So this is a very unusual game because both sides long castled. But I think Topolov had that in mind as soon as Kasparov made this queen and bishop battery. That if he plays bishop h6 and tries to meet me on the king's side, I'll just go to the queen's side. No big deal. And Kasparov made this really interesting maneuver, knight e2 to c1, and he wants to play knight b3 to a5. And not only does he want to play it, he did play it. So that was pretty cool. So knight b3, and the position looks pretty equal, and the reason is, this is pretty equal. Okay. So he took on d4, gets some action, rook takes, and then c5. The reason Kasparov didn't take with the knight, which seems more natural, is don't forget to mute your microphones. I can still hear some people. Yeah. Does everybody mute their microphone? Okay. So, yeah. So knight a5 um, is what white wants to do. So that's why he didn't take with the knight. All right. C5 attacking the rook. The rook goes back. Knight b6. Again, this position is about equal, but it's the kind of equal that you wouldn't think would end in a draw because it's a very double-edged, complicated position where black moved all the pawns in front of his king, but his king still seems pretty safe until it doesn't. And it doesn't seem like white has much of an attack because what, what's white going to do? Bishop on f1 is not great. The queen on h6 seems like it's on the wrong side of the board. And at some point, black wants to play d5 and bust open the center. Kasparov played g3. I think he wants to play bishop h3 and get his bishop to a good diagonal since it can't really go anywhere good here. King b8, stopping bishop h3 check for the moment. Knight a5. And the engine says, if black wants to, he can let white play knight takes the bishop on b7, but grandmasters love their bishops. And the higher rated you get, the more you love your bishops. And the lower rated you are, the more you love your knights, because knights are tricky. And if you're a low rated player, and you're playing other low rated players, they don't see all these knight moves. Okay, they didn't listen to Bob Seeger enough. Also, they never heard of Bob Seeger, right? No. What? Yeah. So an engine wouldn't care very much whether white takes the bishop or not, but a grandmaster does. So he played bishop to a8. He wants to keep his bishop. He likes his bishop. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. Bishop h3. Finally, Kasparov has all of his pieces out. And Topolov plays d5. Now, again, I've said it before. I've said it in other lectures. Topolov is a very aggressive, combative player. He doesn't look at his opponent and say, oh, Kasparov, he's good. I'm going to play passive. Doesn't do that. Topolov plays like Topolov. Doesn't matter who he's playing. He plays aggressive, calculates a lot, and he tries to outcombine his opponent. Unfortunately, his opponent's Kasparov. Truth hurts. Queen f4 check, moves his king to safety. Rook h e1. So now Kasparov wants to put pressure on the queen, threatening to take e takes d5. Topolov played d4. And if Kasparov retreats, then black's game is excellent. Look at that great pawn structure he has. So Kasparov played the attacking move. Knight d5 attacking the queen, and they traded. And now Kasparov has a discovered attack on the queen, and queen d6. Okay, so this is a very famous position. One of the most famous in chess history. I'm sure you've all memorized it your whole life. Exactly. Now, <clears throat> here, Kasparov made a move that... The engine doesn't approve of, but that was in 1999. 
engines nowadays say every move is a draw because engines are crazy now. And I actually looked at this position with Stockfish 13, which I didn't know was out yet. It's not. At depth 71. And it says, this move isn't the best, but it's okay. And it's very important in a brilliancy that the brilliant moves that you play aren't 100% sound all the time. Um, sometimes they lead to a draw if your opponent plays perfectly. But if they don't play perfectly, then you get to win games like this. And you can't really expect a human to defend perfectly for 20 moves. Sometimes they do, but it's rare. And this game could be a boring game. They could trade queens and black plays king b6 and attacks the knight. And, you know, nothing much is happening. Equal material. And probably the game would end in a draw. And after Kasparov's move, the game should probably also end in a draw if two supercomputers were playing now. But this is 1999, and these are humans, and now we have the beginning of an amazing combination. Rook takes d4. Uh, that move not only takes a pawn, but now if black trades queens, queen takes queen, rook takes queen, white's up a pawn, and he's looking good over here on the f file. Looks like things are going to go his way. Okay, now, <clears throat> this is very surprising. This is one of the things I learned today. I learned something. And that's all that matters, really. Not if the sponsor learns anything of the paying customers, but the guy giving the lecture. That's what matters, right? Yeah, yeah, they're nodding here. Okay, now, the best move for black is one you wouldn't think of unless you've already seen the game and seen annotations and remembered them. And none of that is true. So, because Topolov is Topolov, and if you don't believe me, he can show you his driver's license and proving he's Topolov. And I would be remiss to, to not tell you that I picked up Topolov over my head and spun him around. Okay, true story. And after that happened, it wasn't during this game. After that happened, he tried to pick me up, but the truth hurts. Yeah, and it hurt his back too, I think. He was unsuccessful. Now, the best move for black in this position, according to all the supercomputers, is probably a move I would never think of. Okay, and that move is, drum roll, king b6. Confusing the audience. Now, the thing is, if we're going to sacrifice our rook, we need our knight on a5 for attack. We can't play knight b3 and sacrifice our rook because there's, there's nothing attacking. Got to have some attacking pieces. So the engine says after b4, we, we take this, take this, take this. And depending on what engine you use and how deep you have it look, either black is slightly better or it's equal. So this is what Topolov should have done. But Topolov plays the move he thinks is correct. He doesn't play the move that's the safest. So if taking a rook winning wins a rook and trading queens leads to a boring endgame, Topolov is going to take the rook unless he sees a reason why he shouldn't. So it's, it's understandable that Topolov took the rook. I, I don't blame him at all. Okay, and now Black's up a rook. Now, Kasparov doesn't like being down a rook. As our good friend Dominique Myers once said, when somebody told him, you're, you're down a rook. And he said, that's okay, I have another one. Got two rooks. If he's down a rook, he still has another one. Okay, now Kasparov made a move that none of you would think of unless you've already seen the game and you remember it. If I was white in a blitz game, I would play queen takes d4 check. And then after, like, King B8, I guess I'd resign him. Okay, and Kasparov played Rook E7 check. He's got two Rooks, one for each of you. Now, one thing that's impossible to understand, unless you've seen it, and I've seen it, and I'm the only one who's seen it. When I say the only one, 
I'm the only one who's watching this live who's seen it. It's possible, but unlikely, somebody on YouTube, since thousands of people watch the videos, has seen it also. Although it's possible they haven't. I've seen more than once Kasparov analyze his games with his opponent after the game was over. And once you see that, you, you, you live in a different universe than you lived in. Yeah, Kasparov sees every legal move ahead till the end of the game and every variation, every move. And my dad lost to Bobby Fischer in 1963, and my dad analyzed the game with Fischer for an hour, and he said Fischer did the same thing. Like, if you suggest a move, his analysis goes 20, 30 moves deep in all variations. So those guys are hard to beat. You can beat them, but it's not easy. Okay? It's really hard to beat Fisher now. Okay. And um, according to the internet and Kasparov interview, when Kasparov played Rook takes D4, he saw really far ahead, and it happened. A lot of stuff he saw far ahead didn't happen because only one thing can happen. Okay, so first his opponent played king b6, but let's analyze. Let's take the rook. Boo, boo. Queen takes d4 check, probably king b8. Right? Gotta go somewhere. Now, when before white sacrificed his rook on e7, there was a queen on d6. Now, there is no queen on d6. That's the purpose of the second rook sacrifice. So we play check. And there's a bishop on h3 we all forgot about. And then, if you play queen b7, then I play, uh, 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 just kidding, checkmate. I was kidding about knight takes queen. And if you play bishop b7, then I play check. And then I take your queen except for one thing. I don't take your queen. Checkmate. So, so queen takes rook just gets checkmated. Now, if you play king b8, I said if, queen takes d4, threatens queen a7, checkmate. If you take the rook on e7 now, that's the same position we just looked at. Queen b6 check. Okay, so the engine says you should play here, and the problem is, after I take everything, your, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, your, your rook is hanging on h8. Do I take it now or I take it later? Let's see. Do I play? No, 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 I'm sorry. I play bishop takes knight. Right. Then if you play queen takes rook, I play this, and then you resign. Because I checkmate you many different ways. And if you don't, if you play rook takes, then I trade, and then I take this rook with check. The truth hurts. Okay, so Topolov played king b6. This is what Kasparov expected when he sacrificed all of his rooks. Now, Kasparov only sacrificed two rooks. That's it. So who's going to think that's a good game? I was blundering two rooks before Kasparov was born, and Kasparov's older than me. Queen takes d4 check. More sacrificing, more. Okay, so if you play queen c5, then your knight on f6 isn't defended too much. So he played king takes a5. White doesn't have a lot of pieces left. If it was bug house, white would be doing great. But you know, this is real life. b4 check, king a4. Now, after your gears of study, and computer analysis, it's been concluded Kasparov made a mistake here. And actually, he's winning this position. And the move he played gives him an advantage. Topolov messed up. Then Kasparov was winning again. Kasparov played queen c3, which threatens queen b3 checkmate with advantage. What he should have played is rook a7, and the point of rook a7, which he played later, is you want to play this checkmate with queen b3, but you're stopping the queen from taking because rook takes pawn would be mate, so it's hard to defend everything. 
And after Rook A7, the engine line's pretty cool. Bishop B7, defending the A pawn, takes. Queen takes D5, Rook B6. If you take the queen, Rook takes A6 is checkmate. You don't want to get checkmated. Okay, so you, you play A5. A5 is the best move. Rook A6, threatening checkmate. Again, Rook A8, and now this is, this is unbelievable. And that's, I think the reason Kasparov didn't do this is nobody would see this. I know the answer, and I still don't see it. I mean, I do, but I can't believe it. Unbelievable. And I showed this game to Wallace Shawn, and what did he say about the next move? No? Wallace Shawn plays the guy in Princess Bride, the guy who drinks the poison. What would he say about the next move? Anybody? Nobody in my earphones telling me? Inconceivable is correct. Queen e3, confusing the audience. And after rook takes rook, king b2, threatening queen b3 check, and pawn takes mate. Now, white's down a lot of material. A lot. Well, say it louder because I can't hear. What happened? G3? C3. Oh, oh, instead of E3. Um, queen C3 isn't as good as Queen E3, but I forgot why. But I was thinking that too. I think after Queen C3, I can attack the Queen with Queen C4. Yeah, and here I can attack the Queen. So that's that's probably why. You can't move your Queen and attack the Queen. Okay. Now, in this position, I was shocked because the engine said white was winning. And I was like, well, what do you do about that? I mean, my king has a5 now. And the computer's like, whatever. Just take back. Threatening queen a3 mate. Which is annoying. And so if you take the pawn, queen c3, queen a3 mate. I can't even believe White's winning this position, but since the engine said so, I believe it. It said like mate and eight and plus 37 and all that. And the engine just plays crazy moves like queen here, you know, just moves his queen and gives his queen away. All right. So rook a7 was the best move. Luckily, he didn't play that because what Kasparov did and Topolov's mistake makes it much cooler. Very similar to the opera game. Okay. Maybe Morphy didn't play the best, but the way he played made it the most brilliant. So that was good. So Kasparov played queen c3, threatening queen b3 mate with advantage. Now, Topolov played queen takes d5. If you play bishop takes d5, that's worse. Because now after king b2, I'm threatening queen b3 check, and then pawn takes bishop mate. And there's no defense to that. You can try, but trying is the first step to failure. However, against queen takes d5, which Topolov played, now if you play king b2, now black can stop queen b3 and mate. How does black stop it? What's that? Queen d4, pinning the queen, so you, you can't play that. If you don't win, then you lose. There ain't no draw, you just, well, I'm down 50 pieces. Okay, so after queen takes d5, now Kasparov played rook a7, threatening rook takes a6 mate. And he played bishop b7, which is the best move. If you play rook d6, also stopping mate, then your rook is overworked. Sort of like me today, because I made five videos early today. So, and I'd eat some food too. And it's not easy drinking five periods a day, but somebody has to do it. Otherwise, there'll be too much period here. Now, you play king b2, and the a4 mentioned by you, queen d4, the rook is overworked. 
So I can just take the queen. And if you take back, you're not defending a6 anymore. Okay, so he played bishop b7. That's the best move. He took it. You can't take the rook because checkmate. But black is up a rook. And he has an active king for the end game. All right. He played queen c4. The engine agrees. Queen takes f6, threatening. Queen takes a6, checkmate. And now, Topolov made the losing, losing move. Okay, he has some drawing chances if he plays rook d1 check, only legal move. And then queen d4 check um, is one variation, takes, takes, rook takes f7. The engine says white's winning here because the king is no good on, on a4. The problem is taking the f7 pawn isn't because I want to take a pawn. It's because I want to take the f7 pawn. And you're like, what does that mean? That means if it's my move, I play bishop e6 and bishop b3 mate. That's what that means. How are you going to stop that? If you play a5, because you're going to take on b4, you can't take on b4 because rook a7 is mate. And I can play rook a7, and you, you can't stop rook takes a5 mate. So that's winning. So queen d4 is bad, but you can play rook a8, and this is all engine analysis. Queen b6, threatening queen a5 mate. Trade queens, queen d4. And now black has to play a5 to stop bishop e6, bishop b3 mate. And then bishop e6, bishop b3. And this is the funniest variation of all of them. In this position, you can't take on b4. King takes b4, you'd play c3, and black would be PO'd. And if you play rook takes b4, your rook is trapped, confusing the audience. Are you confused? The rook has nowhere safe to go. Okay. So after this, Topolov has to play king b6. Rook takes h7. Now, if I was white, I would think I'm completely winning here. But the engine says like 0.7. I mean, white has like 5,000 extra pawns. What's going on here? So I think white's winning here. I think Kasparov would have won this. Too many extra pawns. And the other way to play, which I already forgot about, is a5 instead of queen d4 check. Bishop d7 is an amazing move. Threatening bishop takes b5 check or queen takes. And if you play rook d5 to defend, queen e3 once again threatening queen b3 check with mate. And then rook d3 is the engine move, but white's up a piece here. Okay, so Topolov should have gone into that worse ending with rook d1 check, but instead, his move, which is worse, makes the game more exciting. So we're glad that he played the worst move. He played king takes a3. And this actually reminds me of my game with Gert Jan de Boer from Vikanze. I think it was 1992, where I sacrificed material and his king ran all over the board. And eventually I made it him, and, eventually, and I won the Vikanze Brilliancy Prize. So I got some extra cash, too. But this reminds me of that, because Black's King is walking up the board. And when I say it reminds me of it, the point of my story is, if White doesn't checkmate Black, well, Black's up a lot of material. Black's up an exchange, the B4 pawn is going away, and Black's going to win the end game. So in my game... If I didn't checkmate my opponent, he would have won too, but he had to give his queen away to not get checkmated, which is what happened later in this game. So I think Kasparov stole every idea I ever had. Lawsuit pending. Something like that. Okay. Now Kasparov made a very um, unusual move. Your kind of move. 
Queen takes a6. King takes b4 is the only legal move. And now, white has no checks. Can't play queen a5, can't play queen a4, can't play queen a3, can't play queen d6, can't take on b5. And if, it, if it's white's, if it's black's move, black just checkmates white. Rip d1 check, queen c3 check. However, there is one check I didn't mention that I think you wanted to mention. You could, but if you play queen a2, then, then I would go check and then checkmate. Or I could trade queens and I'm up material. There's one check I didn't mention. C3. Well, queen a5, the king can take, if you said that. Can't hear. C3 in my ears is correct and in, in my eyes. C3. And that just looks like white ran out of checks. So here's a check. But actually, that check is winning. Obviously, and frankly, king c5, and there might be a checkmate I'm missing, but once I see that, I stop analyzing. Let's see. Can't go as king c5. He played king takes c3. What if he plays king b3, which he did not play? Then I go check, only legal move. Check, only legal move. Always play bishop f1. And white wins. So black has to play king takes c3. Queen a1 check. Amazing. He just keeps checking them. Again, king d3 walks into bishop f1 check. So we got three moves left. And you can't go to b3 because we just looked at that. Then queen a2 check. And we, we, already looked, we already looked at this variation. Actually, queen b2 check is just mate. So that's, that's better. Mate is better. Okay, so he played king d2 because the king didn't go far enough down the board yet. Queen check. Now, if you, you, you can play king e3, king d1, or king e1. King e3 loses the funniest way. Rook check, king takes, checkmate. Okay, and king e1 loses for similar reasons, rook check, and so forth. And then you have to play king d1, and that transposes into the game, actually. Okay, so he played king to d1. No more checks. And not only are there no more checks, he did not check him. However, Kasparov, very familiar with me, we've had dinner many times, he told me how badly I played in a game that I lost once. He's like, ah, oh, terrible. So he knows my rules. So he always played what move? Always play it. Bishop f1. Yeah, attacking the queen. Now, if the queen wasn't on the board, the black queen, then white would play queen c1 checkmate. Pretty cool checkmate. Okay, now, if you take the bishop, which he did not do, queen check, only legal move, rook check, Papa John. Okay. And in this position, Topolov, Topolov's Topolov. He, he was world champion. He's not a joke, right? He took Kasparov's position and threw it to the ground. And he played the move you would all play. It's the best move. Rook d2. Confusing the audience. The audience is confused. Okay, and now Kasparov played one of the three most brilliant moves of the game. Can anybody find it who didn't already see the game? If you've already seen the game, then it's easier. What's that? Rook to c2. Which to c2? Rook. It's white's move. Right. So this is c2, so no. 
Anybody in my headphones? Anybody here? Karen? Correct. Whoever said it. Rook to d7. Confusing the audience. Now, if you were confused, I'm going to unconfuse you. You can call Kasparov a liar, and you might be right. But I've seen Kasparov analyze, so I believe him. I believe him. You don't have to believe him. You can, you can call shenanigans. That's okay. Kasparov said when he played rook takes d4, he saw rook d7. And I believe him. That he saw, like, the rest of the game. Not that the moves were the best, but they're pretty good. So when he played this, he saw this, 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 this. Queen c3 takes... Rook a7 here, 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 takes, king takes, check, 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 bishop f1, rook d2, rook d7. He says, I saw that when I played rook takes d4. I've seen him analyze, so I believe him. I've seen, the, basically, there's four people that I'm 100% sure can analyze every variation of chess all the way to the end during a game. Kasparov, Anand, and Kramnik, because I've seen it, and Fisher, because my dad told me the same story. Right? And somehow, those guys are pretty good. Those guys, world champions, and considered the greatest players who ever lived. Now, the game's not over. But you can't take the queen because it's illegal. Also, white's threatening checkmate, and white's threatening the queen, and white's threatening rook takes rook check winning. So black took the rook, and even in this position, white is not ahead material. However, he is next move. Bam! Now he's up a queen for a rook. However, this is actually quite funny. After rook d3, attacking the f pawn and preparing to play c3, c2, Queen a8, defending the pawn. C3, chess is a funny game. If it was black's move here, black's winning. C2, check, and queen. Man, it's still hard to win. Queen a4, check. King here. And I'm going to get laughed at for quite a long time. F4, saving the pawn. F5, and this is my favorite move of the game. It's the most boring move of the game. I like boring moves. Now, every move wins because you're up a queen for a rook. But I really like this move. I don't know why I like it. I just do. King c1. I like that move. It controls d1. I mean, it controls everything. Black can't do anything. I just like that move. Okay, he played rook d2. He wants to take the h-pawn, and white defends the h-pawn. He doesn't move the h-pawn. He defends it. You see how to defend it? Very good. Go Gus. Queen a7. If you take the pawn, queen g1 check wins your rook. So you can't take the pawn, but your h7 pawn is attacked. And with the king on c1, black can't do anything. You could give black a lot of moves in a row. Now, if the king was on b1, then black could play king d1, threatening c2, check winning. Now black can never win. You can't say, oh, black just does this and white has to stop that. Nope. Black can't do anything. You play c2 and rook d1, king takes pawn. The black can't make any threat with his passed pawn. So in this position, since he can't take this pawn, and the queen's going to come destroy all these pawns in this one, now he gave up. And that was amazing that Kasparov saw so much. And the reason this game is a great game isn't because necessarily the players played the best moves. It's that when... Some people sacrifice who are not the best players in the world and they win. It doesn't mean they calculated everything 
or they had good judgment, sometimes they're lucky, they didn't see anything, but it all worked out, or they were losing and their opponent blundered. At the top level, we very rarely see this because when super grandmasters and world champions sacrifice a lot of material, they're 100% sure they were right. And here, obviously Kasparov didn't see any, everything. The things that he did see were good for him, and he felt it's got to be good. And most super grandmasters won't do that. If it's not mate, they're not sacrificing all their pieces. It's embarrassing. I sacked a rook, I sacked a rook, I sacked a knight, then I resigned. Maybe you guys do that, but the world champions don't do that. If they lose, it's got to be for some boring reason, not, not because they just gave all their pieces away. Yeah, they don't want to lose that way. They want to make it hard to beat them, not easy. And Topolov is a great opponent for this game because he's going to take up the challenge, right? Some other top GMs might be like, ooh, Kasparov sacrificed a rook. I better, like, trade queens and try to draw because Kasparov's better than me. Kasparov calculates better than me. That's not the way Topolov thinks about chess. He trusts his own calculation, and he said, I'm taking that rook. And then, you know, the truth hurts. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. And if you don't trust your calculation, you can't become the world champion by always thinking your opponent's better than you and they calculate better than you. So if you want to be at the very top, like the guys that I mentioned earlier in the lecture, you got, you got to trust your, your analysis. And in that game, Kasparov's analysis was better. And after 22 years, uh, a supercomputer's analysis is even better. Shocking. Slightly better, but better. But I mean, other than not playing rook a7, when he played queen c3, uh, the, the engine thought Kasparov played pretty well. Like, yeah, those moves are good. And... Again, one of the reasons people consider this the greatest game ever is because of who the opponents are. If Kasparov beat me, they would be like, yeah, whatever. But if Kasparov beats Karpov or Topolov or Anand, Kramnik, by sacrificing all his pieces, and the guy's king runs all over the board, and Kasparov wins, now the game is held in high esteem. And it's very difficult to understand not only what happened in the game, but what didn't happen. Topolov had other defenses, which obviously Kasparov had to look at, and Topolov had to make sure he wasn't walking into mate every move. But he still walked his king all the way up the board. So, very exciting game. I love looking at that game because, as you may know, you may know, some people complain the top level now is just boring draws. The reason they say that is because the top level now is all boring draws. The last world championship was a 12-game match and had 12 draws. And when Kasparov and Topolov roamed the earth, then, then this is what happened. But now, you know, Rajabov, you know, draws before the round starts. So, you know, there's a lot of draws now. But they don't have to draw. They can play like this, and they can go down in history as the most exciting games ever played. And so, long after they're gone... People are going to analyze this game just like they do Steinitz von Bartelaben. Those guys aren't alive. Everybody's looking at that game still. Sir, what's that? Yeah, yeah. Always, always, always go to the bathroom. That's an important rule, especially when the lecture is over. Well, thank Grandmaster Gus again for suggesting this game. Um, you can play this game over a lot yourself and look at different variations, and hopefully you have your engine help you at some point because it's, it's too hard for humans, and I would never be so bold as to call Kasparov a human. So thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. Watch more videos on the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta page. Thanks again to our sponsor, Grandmaster Gus, and I'll see you guys next time with another lecture. Bye, everybody. Thank you.